Angus's performances. Now, I know people who've been to see them over the years and have been staggered, even up to black ice, who hadn't seen them before. And we're just amazed at how somebody can go through a set and put that amount of effort into it as Angus does. It is extraordinary. Oh, we're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookedonrock.com. You can find every episode of Booked on Rock there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms, exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, and the latest rock book releases. Also, you can now watch every episode in full on video on the Booked on Rock YouTube channel at Booked on Rock or at bookedonrock.com. Chris Sutton is a returning guest. He's got a new book, ACDC, Every Album, Every Song. One of the greatest bands in rock history. 18 studio albums, two soundtrack albums, three live albums, 57 singles. They've sold over 200 million albums worldwide, and their 1980 album, Back in Black, became the second biggest selling album in history with 50 million copies sold worldwide. In the latest from Sonic Bond's On Track series, Chris Sutton not only gives an analysis of every track on every studio album from ACDC, including B-sides, outtakes, live albums, and box sets, he also interviewed former members of ACDC, collaborators, and friends of the band. A playlist of ACDC is on the show notes page. Chris Sutton, welcome back to the Booked on Rock podcast. I think this is appearance number three. Got to say this, Eric, uh, this is one of the things when I finish writing the book, genuinely, I think I get to talk to Eric again. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. Uh, every time you have a book, I know uh, I'm going to, it's either me reaching you or you reaching me first. Yeah, that's it's right. like, uh, that's it, it's a race to the, to, to the, who gets the first, uh, who gets the first email. So yeah, total of 18 studio albums, two soundtrack albums, three live albums, two box sets, 57 singles. I mean, that's a daunting task. We're not talking about a band who was around for a few years. You managed to do it amazingly, and you include new interviews in this book as well. So tell us about that and what we can get in this book. Well, a couple of things. Is One is I was a little bit lucky because AC, DC have had some time out at various points during what, you know, the Brian Johnson years. So there, there should have been even more albums, really, in effect. Um, as regards interviewees, um, that's a good question. What I do before I start every book is I make a list of everybody, engineers, producers, the band, cover illustrators, the whole lot, everyone, and I approach every single one of them as best as you can. Um, so the ones that you see in the book um, are the ones who chose to be part of it and replied. And I have to say that ACDC are, are probably the most... Um, closed off, if you like, difficult to reach, difficult to get a comment ban that I've encountered yet. And a few people warn me about that. And it's certainly the case. And I respect that. But, but there you go. That's why um, you see who you do in the book and why other people are not there. Yeah, it makes it more challenging. Their very first single released July of 1974, Can I Sit Next to You, Girl, featuring lead singer Dave Evans. The version that Bond recorded with the band is available it's hard to find this one. It's more of a T-Rex sound than any ACDC song that we would know, but they make mm -hmm. a change soon after that. So Dave Evans is out. They bring in a new manager. They decide Dave Evans isn't working out. And here comes Bon Scott. November of 1974, they recorded the High Voltage album, which is released in February of 75. The lead single is interesting. Love song, Oh Gene in parentheses, sounds absolutely nothing like ACDC. Angus no. hates the song, and he can't believe it, it was even chosen as a lead single. But thankfully, the B-side, which was a cover of Baby, Please Don't Go, that was there, so DJs ended up playing that one. But what's the story behind Love Song, and, and why do you think the label, which was Albert Productions, chose that as the lead single? Well, I think I know exactly why. I, I spoke to Michael Browning, who, as you say, was the manager who came and turned things around for them when they... Um, Slack Dave Evans and got Bon Scott. Now, Browning points out that in Australia at the time, there was a very healthy pub rock scene, you know, bands playing in pubs and so on. There was this circuit. But there's also a very healthy pop scene that ACDC, and this is a bit hard to believe, really, appealed to, to young teenage girls particularly, would turn up to their gigs. So it, it was simply a case of, oh, Gene, if you listen to it with the big dramatic intro and the sort of, 
tugging at the heartstrings kind of ballad feel of it, which Bond puts on, they thought really would be picked up by this massive audience that they got in Australia of teenage girls. Now, if that had happened, if the um, the radio stations had played Oh Gene, I don't know what ACDC would have done because the, they didn't like the song, apart from Tony Carenti, the session drummer, who picks it out as the best thing they've ever recorded. Yeah, that's in the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's totally atypical. That, as you said correctly, Angus hates the song. I, I, I think it's the intro's dynamic and interesting and dramatic. Um but but it's not ACDC as, as we would know them at all by any means. And you write their turned over and uh, Baby Please Don't Go and so on. That's much more the ACDC that we know. And that first album is it's a good album and there's there's moments on it that are, are excellent, but it, it kind of is it sort of sets the scene, even, despite the terrible cover, I would say. Yeah, I they've had they had a few covers that the head scratchers <laughs> mm. We'll get to a few more too, but the album did pretty good in Australia, number fourteen. Yeah, it, we've got to say at this point, one of the decisions I had to make in the book was which um, timeline, which path to follow for ACDC, and I've gone with the Australian albums as being the the true vision, which I guess they must be, because the European editions do substantially change um, all the way up. It's only. Um, it's only once we reach Power Age, um, no, not Power Age, sorry, Highway to Hell. That's the first album where the tracks are the same across the world. It does make it difficult going back in time, going through the ACDC catalog. It's really sometimes, I, it's confusing. I can't remember which song is on which album, which version. There's Yeah, there's the Australian version, there's the US version, and then there's an example of an album that's not released in the US until years later, which we'll talk oh, about. Yeah, yeah but... The, you do note in the book, after that first album, they step it up. They up their game with 1975's TNT. What a way to start off the album. The lead track, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Oh. Tell us about the bagpipes. There's a great story on the song <laughs> in the book. Bond had some trouble setting those up in the studio. He did, he did. Um, you know, they were chatting in the studio. and um, that, You have to mention George Young, you know, one of the older brothers of Angus and Malcolm, who really was a a major guiding light in their career and also uh, did a lot of the arrangements with them, played bass on an awful lot of the stuff as well. And uh, in amongst all the talking, he discovered that Bon Scott had played in a pipe band when he was younger. Um, what Bon failed to tell him was that he'd been a drummer in a pipe band and had never actually played the bagpipes at all. And he went out and bought a set of bagpipes for 479 US uh, Australian dollars which would be bad enough to buy two brand new strats at that time. So uh, Mark Evans reckoned. And and Bond just thought, uh, I think as did Tony Iommi uh, when we talked before and when they did Spiral Architect, Sabbath, they were going to put bagpipes on and thought, how difficult can it be to play? Well, the answer is yes, very difficult to play. So Bond does his best at playing them. And the brilliance of George Young, not for the, the last time we'll say this, was to take what Bond had actually managed to get out of the bagpipes and kind of loop it so that it sounds reasonable. If you listen carefully, you can tell that this is somebody who actually can't play the bagpipes, I think. It's just a series of blasts, really, most of the time. Yeah. That he, that he plays. Um, but um, And a shout out, I think, here to, to Jack Black, because I think that song is just one of the big bangers in the ACDC back catalogue. And it always used to astonish me just how little traction he ever got in the live set through the years. It just seemed to vanish without trace. Then out comes School of Rock with Jack Black, and suddenly the song is straight to the top of the best ACDC song list. I mean, people really latched onto that track. And, and it is. You can't put that song on and not feel up and smile, can you? No, I know. It's, it's a classic. I remember I got turned on to it when I was in college. That would have been early 90s. So that was mm. before Jack Black's movie. But I just remember I, remember I had a... a I had a cassette I put together, a mixtape, and I was running out of room at the end, and I had to fade out the bagpipes at the end. It was like, that was such a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would that would have been cool. I don't know, maybe they've done this, but in concert, they bring out an actual bagpipe player right. on stage. What do they do live for this? They they had done that. I think there's some footage on one of the box sets where they they did bring out some sort of pipe band to do it. But but generally um, they didn't. It, it always surprised me they never did it. And say some of the Glasgow dates that you'll know of over the years 
Well, they, they could have had fun with that. And, and I thought they, that would have been an absolute banker. But, um, but no, so the song, strangely, is one that um, isn't there amongst the big bangers. Of the, when ACDC do their live sets, as you all well know, um, you get one or two deep cuts, don't you? That would usually be the way of it. Two or three off the new album, and then the whole run of the ones you expect. Um, I mean, maybe that'll change. Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. There's some great trivia. It's stories behind the songs in the book. One of them is for TNT, which is another ACDC classic. George Young, when he heard Angus chanting along to the song in the studio, he was the one who suggested to add his oi chants in the track. So that was just that was just uh, like happenstance. I love stuff like that. Now, the next release is the band's first international release. 1976, Atlantic signs the band to a worldwide deal, and we get the High Voltage album. Now, the head of the UK Atlantic label picked tracks from yep. the first two Australian releases. High Voltage wow. charted at number 13 in Australia, 146 in the US, but their rise to the top in the US, that's coming. Our next album is Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. That's also from 76 in Australia, at least. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 1981 that it received an international release. And there are so many great songs to choose from, from both releases. Oh, okay. I mean, Problem Child, yeah. Big Balls, Right On, Jailbreak, Rocker, Squealer. But let's talk about the title track to Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. First, where did the name come from? And uh, can you talk about this couple from Libertyville, Illinois, Norman and Marilyn White? What was their issue with this song? But we'll start with the... the the title track and the story where that name came from well it comes from it was a, it was a tv show in in, Aust in australia and um, that he used to watch i think it came from america called beanie and cecil do you know of this yeah yep. heard of it i don't anyway angus used to watch it and um he reckoned that there was a character in it called dishonest john and he used to carry a card around like a calling card which said dirty deeds done dirt cheap special rates for holidays written on it and it was, it was something that he'd stored away and remembered, something that amused him. So that's where the title comes from, of all these dirty deeds, which, which Bonnie's capable of doing, as he outlines in the song itself. And, um, and right near the end of the track, as you, you'll probably know, is he, he gives um, his phone number, um, 36, 24, 36. Um, and it sounds like he says eight on the end of it, but he doesn't. He actually says, hey. But... If you take 36, 24, 36, 8, this was the phone number of Norman and Marilyn White in Libertyville, Illinois, who got so annoyed at the constant phone calls they were getting. And you said that it wasn't released in America late till 81, which is true. Now, you've got to imagine now, these albums are, this album is selling in huger quantities than it would have done back in 76. This is going on the back of, you know, of Back in Black. So everyone's buying this album. There's all these American fans listening to this and um i mean i always used to ring phone numbers i would see in programs and on records you think i wonder who actually answers the phone yeah well eight six seven five three oh nine was the big one that was the famous one so they sued the band for a quarter of a million dollars in damages um demanding that the song was altered but the case was thrown out because they they don't actually say the full number which the fans had misheard in it. But I mean, you can't beat promotion like that, can you? If you're no. a fan, I mean, that's the sort of stuff you dream of. Man, if they had a voice machine, a voice message machine, I'd love to hear some of the messages that were left there. <laughs> can I talk to Bon? Is he? Is he there? Yeah. Is, is Angus yeah. there? <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Dirty Deeds. The album charted at five in Australia and three in the U.S. in 1977. ACDC released Let There Be Rock, number 19 in Australia, 17 in the UK, 154 mm. in the US. This also has an Australian and international version with different track listings. Now, the highlights mm. here are, of course, the title track, also a whole lot of Rosie, Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be, Dog Ate Dog, or Dog Eat Dog, Bad Boy Boogie, another great track. But we can't forget about the title track, Let There Be Rock, which is a classic live it's a must whenever your ACDC plays now, live now. Both bassists, Mark Evans and Angus, they love this album. And Angus said, if you listen uh, to any album from ACDC for the first time, this is the one. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, Mar Mark Evans was fired by the band in May of 77, shortly after this. So now he's replaced on bass by Cliff Williams. 1978, we get Power Age, 
Many fans will say that this is their favorite ACDC album. Rock and Roll Damnation, Down Payment Blues, Give Me a Bullet, Riff Raff, Sin City, What's Next to the Moon, Gone Shootin', Up to My Neck and You, and Kicked in the Teeth. Those are all nine tracks. Now, you lead this chapter by writing, there was an intention for musical changes on this album. So what were those changes? Yeah, well, actually, um, I picked this up. Angus told um, The Quietus um, in 2014 that Power Age was probably us experimenting a little bit. And I'd not seen that interview back at the time. So I went back to the album and thought experimenting. And I, I think basically um, the only one that really stands out for me as being the experiment would be um, What's Next to the Moon. That does kind of stand out a little bit, quite a different vibe to it, almost verging on the psychedelic possibly at times. Um, gun shooting probably sticks out a little bit as um, as being quite a nice sort of low-key sort of groove. And I guess there's the big kind of poppy song on there, which was the big hit single, Rock and Roll Damnation, which was written to order because the record label wanted a surefire hit, which it was over here. Um, and they literally throw everything at Rock and Roll Damnation, and they really, really do... Um, there's um, Insistent Maracas in it, probably played by George Young. Um, the big choruses, tambourine in it. Um, and, and it was a huge success for them, really. Um, but I think really the big breakthrough album over in, in Britain for them that really pushed them over was probably the live album. Um, now, the live album's the sequence at the end of the book. Um, so... I think you do lose that a little bit, to be honest, because that live album was absolutely key in Britain. It really, really was. Went top 20, got to number 13. And all of the songs on it, I think the versions on, if you want, Blood Earth, are all superior to the studio versions, without a doubt. It really is probably one of the greatest live albums ever made, in my opinion. And that was released just before Highway to Hell, I think, right? Yeah, it came okay. out in... Uh, October 78 in the UK, November 78 in, in America. Um, got to 113 in America, which probably sounds a bit ridiculous really now, but you look at that and you, you put that album on, play Riff Raff, and you're in from the first few notes for the yep. ride. And um, then you get Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be, which actually is in tune. And that's one of the things that's quite interesting. If you listen to it back on Let There Be Rock, and the, the guitars are, are quite out of tune. Yeah, uh, on the version on there. Um, one of the things I think Joe Elliott said about Mutt Lang when he comes in was uh, one of the differences he makes. Joe Elliott said, "Well, he got the guitars in tune for a start." Somewhere I remember him saying that um, it wasn't always that bad. In, yeah. in fairness, but the songs that you've mentioned earlier, "Whole Lot of Rosie," "Problem Child," they're they're all vastly superior, I think, on the live album. Often elongated with long instrumental sections. A whole lot of Rosie, you hear the chant, Angus. -na 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 -na. Angus. Yeah. -na -na -na. Did you know it's not, it's not actually a live version on the album? It's not. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that because it really didn't sound authentically live. But where no, did the chant come from? Is that coming from an actual show? The, the chant is definitely bolted on. Uh, wow. From the last okay. Show. Well, it works. And, uh, and it's interesting because actually it's Malcolm that's playing the riff, not Angus at all. The, wow. the chant. And he's actually Malcolm. So you get that. But if you listen to anyone out there is not sure, listen to a whole lot of Rosie, and you can hear that Bond's voice is, is, is pretty similar, if not the same, to what it is on the studio version. And he's completely different to the rest of the live album. I, I hadn't noticed, to be fair, so I started yeah. digging and talking to some other fans. Speaking of, well, Power Age, I mentioned, a lot of fans will say it's their favorite. Power mm. Age, is that your favorite? What is your personal favorite ACDC album? Oh yeah, it's a tough one. There's a devil in you, isn't there, Eric? Yeah, I mean, you, I'm trying to think of what mine devil. would be. I got to think of. I got like a handful I could choose. Well, you get the you get the the best Bond, best Brian. Can you even choose between Bond and Brian? Sort of debate, don't you? Of the era with Bond, Scott, I think Power Age has maybe. I was going to say more authenticity, if that makes any sense at all. It's not as um, sculptured and molded perhaps uh, as say highway to hell which might be the next big contender that people would pick i mean you've got to look at highway to hell and say that's the big breakthrough album so is that the best album they did with bond scott but i, I think i had my problem with that album which we'll come on to is i think side two is perhaps a little bit weak on highway to hell personally 
with the popular choice I, I could be cool and try to pick something obscure or different but i highway to hell for from bond back in black from from the brian years i i just you can't go wrong with either of those and those are the ones those are the first I, first one i got was back in black then i went and bought highway to hell the book done rock podcast will be back after this power age reached 22 in australia 26 in the uk but again us 133 which is so surprising nowadays when you see how popular they are here in the states but there was a while there where they they weren't but we know that would end with highway to hell so did highway to hell one of the greatest albums in rock history right i mean i would i would say in, in the commercial peak of the bon scott era but we'll get to that side too comment i'm interested in that 1979's highway to hell number 17 in the u.s eight in the uk and 13 in australia atlantic in america wanted an album that was going to break through and they finally get it they replaced george young and his producing partner harry vanda with mutt lang on this one but it's interesting because mutt lang wasn't their first choice they wanted to go with eddie kramer who was known for his work with Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, and he also produced Ace Freely's solo album. Uh, who He was known for, for quite a few artists, so certainly wasn't a, a bad choice, but it just didn't feel right with Angus and Malcolm. So they, they got Mutt Lang in instead, and it's magic. I mean, there's something happened there. Now, here are the 10 tracks, Highway to Hell, Girls Got Rhythm, Walk All Over You, Touch Too Much, and I think Beating Around the Bush is the final song on side one. Okay, so side two, Shot Down in Flames, Get It Hot, If You Want Blood, You've Got It, Love Hungry Man, and Night Prowler. Yeah. Where do you hear the biggest difference sonically on this album with Mutt Lang? Because you mentioned Girls Got Rhythm as a revealing song for the differences that he made. Well, it's interesting because uh, you, you mentioned Eddie Kramer, and Eddie Kramer, you'd have thought, would have been a shoo-in to work with them with his, his rock credentials. Um, I suspect the band was still quite sore being forced to, to, to jettison their brother, George, and Harry Vander as producers. Um, and with when you come in with Lang, I mean, as Browning said to me, Michael Browning, the manager, he doesn't really have any rock credentials at all. He had to keep it quite quiet from the band that, that uh, Lang had produced the Boomtown Rats, for example, because if he, he told them that, they'd go, no, forget it, we're not even going to work with the guy. But what Lang does do is to give um, ACDC a kind of a spit and a polish um, and make them more radio friendly and acceptable to a wider audience. Now, by that, what I'm talking about is bands like ACDC, um, Van Halen, and any other bands. You, you have a core audience, which is people like me and you, and we, we buy everything and we're there. And then you pull in all these other people who aren't so bothered. You know, they'll hear the single on the radio or whatever, and, and, and like casual, but they'll, they'll fill in all those millions of people who buy the records, but they, they won't go back and buy other six or seven albums before it, probably. They'll just be in for that one. Kind of like with ZZ Top's Eliminator. I know so many people who bought Eliminator, but, but didn't go back and buy any of the other early albums at all. So I think what Lang does for a start, the thing you notice is um, the choruses are so strong with Lang. The backing vocals are so tuneful. And the whole thing, every ACDC album has these big backing vocals on the choruses, you know, where you see, you see, Mal you see Malcolm and Cliff come forward on stage to do the vocals. And if you go before this album, that's not really the case. There's moments when they get these big gang backing vocals, but it becomes a massive feature of the sound from Highway to Hell Onwards. Um, the, the title song itself, you, you can almost see them walking up to hit those backing vocals when they come to the chorus in your head. And, and that's the difference. And he sweetens the sound a little bit, not too much, I would say. I think... For me, Highway Tales a little bit of a hybrid album. I think don't think Lang goes as far with the sound as he does on Back in Black, or it's a change in the studios or something. I think there's still a little bit of rawness going on at times on the Highway Tale album that certainly smoothed out, and I think and largely gone by the time they get to to Back in Black. That's having spent so long listening to the albums recently, again and again and again. But that's what I'm picking up, and tracks like Girls Got Rhythm. Um, touch too much, uh, probably a little more commercial with a small C than ACDC would generally be used to. And I notice this because I listen to Girls Got Rhythm and I'm okay with it. Then in comes Walk All Over You, and I'm more sold on that. I'm more in for the ride with that one. Yeah. And that reminds me more of 
what I like on ACDC. And I'd, I'd said to you that I have a little problem with side two. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, shot down in flames, get it hot. If you want blood, you've got it. Love Hungry Man, Night Prowler. Well, Angus has picked Love Hungry Man as one of his least favorite ACDC songs for a start. And again, there's much Lang influence on that. And, and And I really like Love Hungry, remember? I'm not necessarily sure that it fits on an ACDC album. Um, it, I think it depends what mood I'm in when I've got up or what I'm doing when I listen to it. Um, Get It Hot, I'm not so keen on um, at all. And I'm not sure about Night Prowler either, to be honest. Hmm. I, 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 I don't necessarily see it as the best end to an album that, that it could have been. Yeah. Love Hungry Man's got an interesting bass line from Cliff Williams. Oh, it has. It really, really has. But Angus apparently listens to it, you know, and thinks, oh, really, that's that was going a bit far, maybe, on, on what we should have been doing. Yeah, I was I was just listening to Brian Adams' album that Mutt Lang produced. Like, if you, I guess, if you listen to enough music from that era, that especially uh, when Mutt Lang was producing albums, you could just tell, like, Pyromania, well, mm-hmm. Highway to Hell, mm-hmm. and, and Back of Black, but Pyromania, and um, Hysteria, and and Wake Up the Neighbors was Brian Adams. The gang vocals, that's a big thing for for Mutt. Mm-hmm. But he's also on there as well. Let's give the guy credit. If yep. you're listening, you start to tune in. I'd say to anyone listening to this podcast, go and listen to Highway to Tell or Back in Black. Listen to it four or five times on the trot. And suddenly things you start to get things that you've either shut down on or ignored because of familiarity, maybe. But he's there. You can hear Mark Lang clear as day on the backing vocals. He's the top voice. And, and he's, let's be honest, he's the best singer on the backing vocal. You can tell. He's a hard interview to get, though. He doesn't Impossible. do interviews. Yeah. No, I got hold of someone close to him and no reaction at all. And the same, actually, and while we're on it, with I, I didn't think I'd get Brian or the Youngs or, or any of those people. So the people I tended to go with those more on the fringes. Um, Mike Fraser was a complete surprise to get interviewed. I That's a great one. Michael Browning, I didn't expect that either. Yeah. Uh, so he was really good to talk to. Um, but they're very, very closed off, as I said, very contained. Yeah, just the yeah. fact that you were able to get some people within their circle was impressive. Fraser has a great story that I, I'm thunderstruck. I want to ask you about that. It's one of my favorite stories. Uh, but let's let's go back now to so 1979 into 1980, and the story is well known. We know what happens to Bond. February 19th, mm-hmm. 1980. He's only 33. Mm-hmm. Acute alcohol poisoning. Coroner classified it as death by misadventure. 32-year-old Brian Johnson, singing in the band Jordy, also had a little business. I think it was a vinyl car roof fitter in England. I think that was the business he had. I've also heard that he was living at home. He was living at home with his parents, just trying to make ends meet. And he gets the call to audition for a gig in March of 1980. Don't tell him what it's for, who the band is. He just shows up, and sure enough, there's he walks in, and he, I think he saw Malcolm and Angus and the guys shooting pool. And he's like, okay, I think uh, this is for ACDC. And he gets the gig. We know that. Back in black, 1980. And the numbers don't lie. It sold an estimated 50 million copies worldwide, making it one of the best-selling albums in music history. Fourth best-selling album in the U.S. Now, here's a wild stat. The best-selling album that never reached the top spot on the American charts. It reached number seven. It was number one in Australia and the U.K., but not the U.S. Ten tracks all stellar with one, maybe even two being timeless songs that will live on. Well, they'll live past us. <laughs> that would be, I would say back in black and definitely you shook me all night long. So here's the full track listing. Now hell's bells shoot yeah. the thrill. What do you do for money, honey? Or what do you do for money, honey? Giving the dog a bone. Let me put my love into you. Finishing side one, side two, back in black. You shook me all night long. Have a drink on me, shake a leg, and rock and roll ain't noise pollution. There are so many great stories in the book. Yeah. Let me just pick one. What's the story behind Hell's Bells in terms of the lyrics and the bell? Yeah, well, the bell. I mean, that was an interesting thing. I mean, I remember coming back and putting the album on, and. Th- and there was something, as soon as you heard that bell, to me, I, ACDC, Highway to Hell, Bonnie, here we are with Brian, I'm sitting at home putting this on. And, you know, the impact of this record on that first day was immense. Somehow the band had 
it was to me it was like they'd grown up or something and, and had gone to a next level that they, they couldn't get to suddenly they were right there with a terrific set of songs as you just said and it opens up with hell's bells which is a very brave kind of powerful tribute to bun as soon as you hear that tolling bell um it, it was quite affecting i remember the first time to think to open with that it was very clever and uh, they approached um, the Taylor Foundry in Loughborough in Leicestershire to make a bell. And they ended up making a one-ton bell tuned to E, which was then pitch corrected to C for the recording. The original plan was to record the Loughborough World War I Memorial Carillon set of bells. But they couldn't do that because the pigeons kept coming out and making a noise and they couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> I love that story. So in the end, they did use the bell recorded at the foundry and um, live. And, 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 and I keep checking. I, I, I think originally it was an actual bell that Brian used to ring in 8081. It isn't anymore. He kind of, they use a recording, don't they? But I think originally it did used to actually make a noise, as I remember it, the bell. Um, and it's interesting because Brian's track record of actually writing songs with Geordie, the band he was in over here, who were kind of a, pop rock band in the in the vein of Slade or Sweet, if you like. He hadn't really had a track record of writing lyrics really at all. I think he'd written about nine songs or co-wrote them. And he does actually say in his own book that he had writer's block uh, on, on arrival and the tropical storm hits Compass Point Studios where they're recording in the Bahamas. And um, Brian Lang commented on the, it being rolling thunder um, and Brian said they called it in Britain and he went off and, you know, basically said he was given a weather report, you know, in, in terms of the lyrics. But it is an immensely powerful opening track. Uh, I've got to say at this point, you know, that if you look at the track list for that album, Back in Black, it, it, it constantly amazes me when you go back on side two. You open with Back in Black, which I think is quite kind of amusing. You know, you've turned the record over, you're back, that kind of thing. But you shook me all night long. Now the song has risen to the way it looks to me almost buried on side two, track right. two. The, you, you think it would be side one right near the, the top yeah, somewhere. Yeah, because that's what they used to do back in the day. They'd stack a lot of the hits up front on the first side. Um, and I, I looked at people who said, oh, it isn't the best ACDC album. There's other better albums. I looked through all this and I listened to this album again and again and again. I thought, do you know what? It, it is the best, really, I think. Generally, I don't think the numbers lie. I think that there really is magic or alchemy or uh, given the amount, the, the very short period of time they had to record this album, it is, and, and the backstory of Bond having passed oh, away. Oh, yeah. Before. Yeah, we didn't mention that. It was like with all within the same year, within months, like just two, three months time they were back in the studio or they were at least rehearsing or uh, auditioning, I'm sorry, auditioning new singers because the, the parents of Bond told Angus and Malcolm move forward they did i mean he died, the in february, he died in february they recorded it april till may and they won't have been the whole of april wow. till may um, and then it was it was released in july i mean that's extraordinary wow. to come out of an album of that quality yeah extraordinary yeah i think part of the reason is possibly because i think malcolm and angus had always written lyrics as well as bon i'm, I'm sure they chipped in and, and did bits so they had always written lyrics to some degree and michael browning was adamant that back in black was, was he said that's got to be a malcolm title that looks exactly like a, a malcolm title to me yeah and then of course there, there's the story of did bond write lyrics or not and that's what i want to ask you when we get to you shook me all night long but before we get to that one back in black the title track there's a story Angus tells that you put in the book of the origins of this one. Malcolm came up with the riff, but he wasn't convinced it was good enough. That's amazing. Yeah. I think it was on acoustic yeah. too, initially. He'd, had, he'd been sort of playing around with it for about three weeks or so, and he apparently came into Angus one night and said, have you got your cassette? You know, Can I record this? Can I put it down? Well, it's in my head. It's driving me mad, and I won't get any sleep till I put it on cassette. And he said, uh, he said to Angus, what do you think of this? I, I don't know if it's crap or not. But what Malcolm came up with is one of the probably the catchiest big beast riffs in rock music yeah. ever written. Now, my youngest daughter, Nula, I'll give her a shout out here, and she's quite right. She says, you cannot walk down a street or anywhere and have back in black on your headphones or whatever and not feel pumped up and live and ready for anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's what's so great about ACDC's music. It, it always manages to do that for me. But a song like that, 
undeniable. Undeniable. I think it was on acoustic when he put it on the, I, I mm. may have heard wrong, but I, I recall, I yeah. think that on the cassette tape, it was on acoustic. Yeah. That, uh, that's amazing that Malcolm just, I don't know if it's good enough. <laughs> Yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> yeah, and you shook me all night long. So this is this is where I want to get to the, the the controversy. Did Brian write all the lyrics? Some none, and there have always there has always been those who believe that the lyrics on this album came from Bon Scott's Notebook. Okay. So you do address this in the book. What's been the story regarding that, and what do you believe is true? Well, the situation is this: is is definitely brought, Bon Scott used to make notes and come up with ideas, catchphrases, things he heard, and write them down. And and we, we know this is a fact because there are people who, who saw that book he would carry around with him. One of them was a guy who used to write for Kerrang! and Classic Rock, Malcolm Dome. Now, he says he, he'd seen this notebook, and not long before Bond died, and he swears blind that he actually saw some notes written in the book. And one of the lines that he saw written down that caught his eye was, she told me to come, but I was already there. And he was absolutely adamant on this. And it does sound like the sort of thing Bon Scott would write. Um, then Brian actually said in uh, 2021, he told Absolute Radio that Malcolm and Angus said, we got a song, we got a title, and the title is You Shook Me All Night Long, which, which means that Malcolm and Angus must have come up with obviously the title, or possibly Bonded, but certainly Brian didn't. So Brian is basically, he says, if you listen to the chords, it all kind of falls into place, what lyrics he would use. Um, and he says so, that he, he just wrote the lyrics to, to fit that. But the, the problem really is, it's twofold. One is that ACDC's lyrics do get noticeably, shall we say, um, a bit more simpler, maybe as the years go on. There's less... Cleverness. I mean, Bon Scott was was very much a wordsmith and was very um, was very clever with the way he would phrase things and say things and put things across. And that does really go as the band go on. So, would they have used Bon Scott's notes when they're in this situation where he's passed away in February? They haven't got long. You've got a new singer who's only written or co-written nine songs. You've got Malcolm and Angus who can certainly write lyrics. Well, we see that later on. You can see the kind of stuff that they tend to come up with. Would they have used some notes and phrases from Bon Scott? And I, I honestly think, personally, no evidence. I think they probably would. I, I would. How would? Why would you not do that? And I don't know, even know why you need to keep it a secret. Why not? Well, I think, I think the been... trouble is the trouble is it goes with the credits on the album. The Mary. publishing. The publishing, all songs, Young Young Johnson, and that's what it says. But didn't uh, so, haven't they secretly? The story is, I think Malcolm Dome talked about this, or maybe it was. Uh, yeah. Oh boy, uh, it was in another yeah. book uh, that Just they were giving a uh, Jesse Fink, and Jesse was on this this podcast, and and he talked about it, and it's in his book that they secretly gave publishing to the uh, Bon Scott family. Yeah, I must give a big shout out uh, Jesse Fink's two books on yeah. uh, Bon Scott and ACDC. Um, are, are essential reads if you're a fan. Now, you yeah. might disagree with some things he says, which would be your right to do so. Well, but he talked that, about it here. He had some yeah. death threats. I mean, he had, yeah. He, yeah, he had some fans who were not happy with, with what he wrote, but his intent was not to stir things no. up. He just was looking to find out the truth. Again, I go back to well, what's that would have been. I think it would have been a nice story to say that Bond wrote some of the lyrics and just put him on the publishing, and it would have been, I thought it would have been cool. I, I I would have thought so too, but we have another situation. We have a couple of situations going along where things aren't perhaps quite what you might expect them to be as regards to their publishing and credits, I would say. But that's probably a big one. But they obviously felt we want to move forward. This is the band now. We don't want to sort of have, look as though we're relying on some. I don't know. Yeah. I, Credibility. They want to make sure that people know Brian is, they don't want to make people think Brian is not capable of writing the lyrics. Maybe that's what they were thinking. Something like that. But I, I have looked at the lyrics because I'd read Jesse's book, so I've gone through them, and, and I do think he's right. I think as you go on, the kind of the cleverness and um, the wordplay definitely does go as they go on. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. 
Chris Sutton, he's the author of ACDC, Every Album, Every Song. March 29th, it's out in the UK. Here in the US, May 31st. So high expectations for the follow-up to Back in Black. In 1981, ACDC released For Those About to Rock, and it hit number one in the US. First number one in the US. Number three in both Australia and the UK. Let's get it up in the title track were the singles. We know Angus was inspired by a book he was reading about gladiators and it's likely daniel mannix's 1958 book those about to die yeah talk about that in the book but those cannons going off we still don't know where they were recorded there's a mystery on that yeah there is i mean the book um it took me a while to dig this out but as soon as i knew that ridley scott had based the whole of gladiator on daniel mannix's book and then i looked at the publishing history of it and any other books on gladiators Daniel Mannix's book for those those about to die. I would think he's certainly the one Angus must have read. It's um, it's one of ACDC's biggest songs. I get the hair stand up on my neck every single time I hear it from that intro. Every time, I mean, it just gets to you. It really, really does. Um, my only problem on the intro of the song actually is Brian. A bit of controversy. I, I don't like the bit he does before he does his first line, where it sounds like he's standing at the side and kind of scatting and joining in when he comes in with a stand up and be canty for what you're about to receive i, I think it's great but I, I wish they just left it left him alone until that point just let the intro be be instrumental um i spoke to the engineer dave thoner who worked on it i thought i'm going to find out about the cannons how the cannons were done and he just outright refused it's a trade secret we are never going to tell anyone how the cannons were created and that made me into the thought, so they didn't actually record cannons, maybe? Is it something like that? I don't know. But they're notoriously difficult to get on record. There's some on Alice Cooper's Hello, Hooray, right at the end that you can only barely hear if, if you know they're there. And I remember the Boston Pops who were an orchestra in America, and they did the 1812 Overture with Tchaikovsky, and there's a whole bit on the back of the old pooch my dad had about how difficult it had actually been to record cannons and make them sound like cannons rather than something pathetic or, you know, um, but th- th- it's amazing. And another point I wanted to make here is you listen to that song and there's probably a lot of people who haven't. Go back and listen to the studio version. The thing that hits you is how much more kind of um, slow it is. You listen to the live versions and they it, it, it it's played with a much greater ferocity and tempo than, than the original version is. I got to listen to the two, yeah. Line them up. Yeah, the, the the energy of that song is I can imagine when they're live, but yeah, that's cool. It's another one of the ACDC mysteries. It's uh, <laughs> old school, old school. You got to have a little mystery. 1983's "Flick of the Switch" followed number 15 in the U.S., three in Australia, four in the U.K. Mutt Lang was gone. The band wanted this one to be as raw as possible. Guns for Hire, "Flick of the Switch," and "Nervous Shakedown" are the singles. Mixed response from audiences and, and critics, right? Because I Martin Popoff, the author, was on. He actually lo- he loves the album, but okay. I, I I know those who who don't. They they just feel it's a little too maybe too rushed. I don't know. The sales of the album weren't good. What do you think of the album? I, I maybe not too rushed, but maybe I don't know. Maybe it just la- it lacked the 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 production guidance of a Mutt Lang. But that they wanted it well, to be raw. They wanted it to be like spur of the moment. Let's just turn the mic on, turn the gear on, and let's go. I believe that Lang was originally going to do the album, and things fell through. But they'd spent so many months in the studio doing for those about to rock, with Lang's kind of, as you'll know, precision recording techniques. And let's try that again. Let's try that again. Try that again. But of course, you know, back in those days, um, which are the points I've made on the uh, previous chats with yourself, you, you didn't know this. You you would get a review in the press. If you if you saw it, that would tell you what you're going to get. But by and large, guys like me, we went out, we bought the album blind because we loved the band, and then you found out it's what you got. So if you were one of these millions of say say American fans who who coming with Highway to Hell back in black for those of us, right? Yeah, you're going to get a big shot when you put Flick of the Switch on because suddenly you're thinking, well, what's going on here? I mean, it's raw from the first track, Rising Power, and I love Rising Power. I think ACDC actually have had this tremendous thing of having a, like a terrific song as the opening track on their album. I love Rising Power. I think the album's, it is very raw, so it does lack some of the uh, the subtleties that 
perhaps Lang would have put in. But I, I think it's a strong set of songs. I think the songs are as strong as they are for those about to rock, but they don't have the production finesse, that's for sure. It really, really doesn't. Um, in fact, there was trouble recording it because that's had to redo um, Brian's vocals. Um, it was originally recorded back at Compass Point in Nassau with Malcolm and Angus apparently producing it. That's where they, then, that's where they recorded Back in Black. And I think yeah. they record for for those about to rock there too. Uh, let me have a look. I'm just going to think where where was for those about to rock recorded. I think it was certainly they might have gone to New York for some of that. I think possibly um, Paris, mostly in Paris for those about to rock. So I, I think it's a good album. Flick of the switch. I think there's some great songs. Like there's some that are a bit pedestrian, perhaps. We were talking earlier about the lyrics possibly going down a bit, and there's certainly some. Some examples of that on this a brain shake, for example, uh, deep in the hole. Um, there's scarcely any lyrics on those tracks, really, other than the ones, the title. Yeah, um, I, I was just going to say I had my mic muted. And I was talking there and you couldn't hear me. Just my lips are moving. But the ACDC sound, you know, it's so addictive. So just to, to, to get back to a flick of the switch, I mean, just there. So I, I can listen to any ACDC album, really, just because the sound is just so mesmerizing to me so i i can't say a bad thing about any acdc album as a whole but you know with flick of the switch yeah there are songs that i will skip over but still yep. i think i appreciate the the effort that they made they wanted it to be raw they wanted it to, even the videos i think were very simple if i recall correctly just black and white them in the in the studio i think making the video I I thought the cover was one of the big problems of the album, you know, Eric. I mean, again, back in the day, covers were so vital. You'd look at the album and think, oh, yeah, right. great. But there's nothing to me about that cover that makes me think, yeah, great, I want this. Pretty yeah. simple. It's like almost like a, a drawing, like a pencil drawing. Or... It is. I, mean, and yeah. I, I think maybe it sounds ridiculous, maybe, maybe if the cover had been better or bigger, maybe it might have made the album feel more like something better than it was to some people i i, I don't know mm. but there's some great songs on there there really is um i like nervous shakedown very much I'm yes sure you do. one of my all-time favorites yeah from uh, the uh, from the brian era yeah yeah you, you know it's funny t talked about in those days you bought the album blind i've heard uh, kiss fans talk about buying a ticket to go see kiss and it turns out ace wasn't even there it was vinnie vincent in the young makeup that's what it was like back then you know, it was yes, just, it was. Yeah, you just, even in the newspapers, the advertisement had Ace's picture on it. It was a whole different era. Now you could, now you could, now you have to actually make an effort to not get online and spoil it. Because if you're going to go to see a concert, you can find out what the set list is going to be. You are, you, yeah. you could, you could ruin the, the surprise on your own. To, so we've come that far to where you can know whatever you want to know ahead of time. Whereas back in those days, it was, it was all a surprise. Absolutely. I mean, some bands um, you know, on a Black Sabbath talk about, you know, that they suffered with technical ecstasy because of punk, which hadn't even really happened in the UK when it came out. But, but everyone I know who bought that album bought it because we like sabotage. It's simple as that. that yeah. You know, when you buy in, you think, oh, I like that one. I'll, I'll, I'm going to go again. Yeah. Yep. So ACDC, in the, as, as we get now in, more into the 80s, they remain one of the biggest touring acts the rest of the decade. But the albums, you could say, they result in, in uneven results. 1985's Fly on the Wall came next. They oh, okay. released the song Who Made Who for the Stephen mm -hmm. King film Maximum Overdrive and put it on a soundtrack slash best of album called Who Made Who. 1988's Blow Up Your Video was the last of the decade. They fared well on the charts, sold well. And uh, this goes back to what you're saying, just being a huge ACDC fan, the sound of ACDC, I can enjoy those albums, and I, quite, I find quite a few of them uh, that I like. Sink the Pink, Shake Your Foundations, I love Who Made Who, Heat Seeker come to mind. What do you think of the second half of the 80s output from ACDC? Yeah, I've got to mention, uh, got Big Gun as well, haven't we? Big Gun, uh, was that 90s? Big Gun would yeah. have been, yeah, that would have but been 90s. I think where I'm going with that is that for me, it's the era without Phil Rudd is the way I yeah. like to think as well. Um, and I think he was a huge, it's not to decry Simon Wright's efforts and Chris Slade's efforts, who were both fine drummers, 
But the sound of ACDC, um, for me, you've got to have Phil Rudd in there. I hear you. Yeah. It's I, very I evident. Do like I don't, I don't like Chris Slade's drums on Razor's Edge, and he's an awesome drummer. He's a phenomenal I, – I just don't like it, – it's, it's, it just proves that it's not that easy what Phil Rudd was and is doing. That's interesting you say that because um, I was nervous about saying that myself at times. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, Chris Slade's a brilliant drummer, man. I love him. The firm is phenomenal. But it's just a certain sound, a tightness to the Phil Rudd sound. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think they start to struggle a little bit with, um, I mean, uh, maybe there was a drop-off in, in audience and sales. I mean, Fly on the Wall's production is, is pretty rough, to say the least, I would say. Um, but then you got Who Made Who, which is a great song. I mean, that, I think that, that, that kind of brought them back a bit. Blow Up Your Video um, is, a, is, a, is a good album, but it's got Heat Seek, and you'll see this going on there with track one. That, that's your go-to track often on an ACDC album, Heat Seeker. I love that song very much indeed. I like, there's um, more on that album I like to rough stuff I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's another great but, song. But there. Malcolm, we should know too, Malcolm was having his problems with alcohol, so he wasn't, yeah. he wasn't as fully focused or even part of the picture as we get towards the end. Of yeah, the range of age. It, there's the other thing you see with ACDC where it, it, you get this this comeback album thing, ACDC are back. I think Razor's Edge was one of the times I started to hear this. And it was only two years since they'd been away. And then they come out with Razor's Edge after the blow up your video. And there's some great stuff. The title track on Razor's Edge I really like. Yeah, let's go lot. there. Yeah, let's go with let's let's yeah, 1990, Razor's Edge. Yeah, big comeback. Thunderstruck, are you ready? Money talks, all the hit singles. But it, yeah, it was a comeback. The album uh, goes to number two in the U.S., four in the U.K., three in Australia. But yeah, there are changes that the band made. Talk about that. A sober Malcolm makes a huge difference, oh, yeah. but also lyrically now, there's a there's a decision made on this. Oh, yeah. At the time, I remember this vividly. We were told, so we were told in the press that Brian was going through a, a divorce, and 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 couldn't focus on doing the lyrics and, and so on. So uh, Malcolm and Angus were going to be responsible for the. Um, the lyrics, uh, you know, and the music as well. But then in 2022, Brian gives an interview to Rolling Stone and says it was a management decision. It wasn't anything to do with me. And in his words, it was, listen, Brian, I think the boys are going to write all the lyrics now. And he says he didn't mind. I mean, uh, which is very big of him because it means he's now out of the publishing picture completely. Everything goes to Angus and Malcolm in terms of the songwriting. Although later on, we do, he does claim to write some lines still. Famous. There's one on Black Guys we'll come to where he, he claims to have written one of the lines. So I would imagine he still chipped in, but, but didn't get any publishing for it. Yeah, Jesse Fink, I remember saying on this podcast that he felt it was just for publishing reasons. That was his opinion. Um, it's a bit hard. I can see why he says that, and it's hard to, to disagree, isn't it, really? Yeah. So It does look a lot like that. Tell, tell me this story. I've heard it. I've read it. It's been. It's in one of the books I have about Thunderstruck mm -hmm. and Fraser, and and Angus with the cigarette in his mouth, recording the guitar part, which, by the way, folks, is all one take. <laughs> That's Angus, man. Yeah. When I, yeah. When I did this book, one thing I noticed was ACDC actually don't talk about their songs very much in interviews. You know, they'll talk about one or two songs per album at most. Otherwise, it's a case of Here's our new album. This is what we've put out. But so I thought there'd be loads of comments on lots of the songs. There, there just isn't in interviews anywhere. But so Angus basically on the blow up your video tour is visiting his wife's parents uh, who live in Holland, as you may know. And he, he's traveling there after the Stockholm gig uh, in March 88. And, and his aircraft gets struck by lightning en route. And fortunately, there's they land without any problems. But it's from that that he got the idea of writing, uh, coming up with what became Thunderstruck um, as a practice thing on the guitar. You can hear that it's probably a practice thing to limber up on if you think about it. And he thought it was interesting, put it down, gave it to Malcolm, who thought, yeah, this has really got something, this. So uh, Angus goes away, comes back, by which point they've worked out an arrangement and, and everything. And uh, Mike Fraser picked it out as one of the best moments recording he ever had with ACDC. Mike was engineer and co-producer on that album. And um, 
they thought that there should be some kind of an intro and Angus had got the idea for it and wanted to try it and sits on a stool with his guitar, lights his cigarette. They start the tape rolling and Angus starts playing that, wiggly, 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 you know, the, that famous line. And it was only supposed to be on the intro, says Fraser. That was it. And then the song would come in. But he just kept going. Angus just keeps going and going and going. Doesn't even take the cigarette out of his mouth. All the way to the end. Even does the slow down without having to do that separately. Slows it down naturally to stop. And he's still got this long ash of smoke <laughs> on the end of the cigarette that's still in his mouth. Now, if it was me or you and we smoked, we, I'd be sat there like this, nervously trying to get through it and get it right. Not angered. Like the cigarette, do the job. Job done. In the zone. I love that story. And, he, and Fraser said, yeah, it's all one take. I mean, they fade down throughout the song, but there's no splicing together. There's no studio magic. It's all one take. So now, next time you listen to that song, you guys will listen to this now. Just keep that in mind. One take. Angus, yeah. the man. Yeah, that, that puts ACDC back in the game, Razor's Edge. And all of the classic songs they now have at this point, I mean, they're a huge concert draw. So they released yep. the live album shortly after that. Now, studio albums, the, they released one more in the 90s. That's 95's Ball Breaker, which is produced by Rick Rubin, which I don't think they had a great experience. I know I, on YouTube, there's audio no. of Malcolm and Angus talking about each album, and they really just they yeah. did not have a great experience with that. But the title track I love, Hard as a Rock, Hail Caesar, and Cover You in Oil were the three singles. Number one, Australia, no, uh, six, UK, four, US. Then they kick off the 2000s with Stiff Upper Lip, number seven in the U.S., 12 in the U.K., three in Australia. The single Stiff Upper Lip, Safe in New York City, Satellite Blues, Safe in New York City. I remember they, I think they just pulled. That was shortly after 9-11. Remember they pulled yeah. the, the song on the video. It, it would be yeah. eight years until we get another studio album. Eight years. What were the reasons for the delay? Well, we, I mean, they really had come back and the band were going great. We got Phil Rudd back with Ball Breaker, which was, you know, an absolute joy um, to, to fans like myself. Love but the title track. I think this, uh, that era of ACDC, Ball Breaker, Stiff Up, I love those albums. I mean, some people say that they're not as good, but for me, I can listen to those albums all day long. Great yep. songs, the groove, the feel, the yep. riffs. It's ACDC, yeah. man. You're getting what you're expecting. You get what you want. Yeah. The great riffs. It had been eight years. So you're thinking, what's going on? I mean, it was a shock when the album came out. But they'd left Atlantic Records in 2002 and they'd signed a, a multi-album deal um, with Epic. Um, and, and, and obviously the band take time off anyway between tours. But the major delay seemed to come because there were changes in Sony, which saw the band shifted from their imprints of Epic to Columbia. And the, but the big one is probably Cliff Williams. Um, again, I don't remember hearing about this at the time. And I looked, but apparently he had a serious accident in 2005 when he'd uh, taken a bit of a tumble, put his hand out to break his fall and had landed on some broken glass and it cut the nerves and tendons in his left hand. And he had to have two surgeries, a lot of rehab, um, 18 months that, that he was out for. And in 2021, he said that he can still only play with two fingers, the two on the outsides. Mm. The two middle fingers, he keeps out of the mix. He can make flexibility, but he can't make a fist, but he can't bend those fingers individually. And I don't remember hearing at all about no, that. No, no. And credit to the guys. They waited it out. They could have replaced them and moved forward quicker, but they waited. It, 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 did, it is to their credit. I mean, it, it basically, um, according to the Youngs, they've got around 60 to 70 song ideas. And that's worth keeping in your mind at this moment. 60 to 70 songs by the time they go into the Black Ice sessions. Which would we'll pay off that. ultimately with the sad passing oh, yeah. of Malcolm. So, And they pick 18 was the idea. In the end, um, they were going to pick 11 out of 18. In fact, they, they opted for 15 songs, which is the longest ACDC album. Yeah, Black Eyes you're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah. Black you said too many, yeah. too many. Uh, but you saw, there was also issues with Atlantic, right? They signed with Sony during yeah. that. Okay. Sony, the Sony yeah. Music Imprint, Epic Records. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Black Ice, like... too many tracks. Yeah, there are a lot of 15 and all. Some great tracks on it. But yeah, that was your comment in the book. Too many songs. Could have been their best since Back in Black, you say. 
it's a strong album. It's a very, very strong album, and, and credits to them you know, for putting that as an album um, that was so long, I guess. But if it was, say, back down to, say, you know, eight, ten songs, if you can imagine that and picking that from Black Ice, it, it, it would obviously make it a stronger album because, to some extent, if you're going to have 15 songs, there's got to be some weaker ones in the mix somewhere, you would think. And I think there is on Black Ice. There are some that, for me, aren't, aren't great, um, and I think if you took them out, the album would, would have been a stronger album. Here's a theory, just putting it out there, because it was during Black Ice that Malcolm's Dementia first started. Do you think right. they figured, let's just put as many as we can on the album because we don't know how much longer Malcolm can contribute? Yeah, well, again, the kind of the silence from the band, you pick up things now. I think in the book, I actually was writing this book on a train a lot of this book was written on train. On a rock and roll train? A guy, a guy sat next Sorry. to me and said, oh, what, he said, what are you doing? Yeah. I told him what I was doing. And he turned out he'd worked as crew at various concerts and stuff. And he, he told me that there was a, another person backstage on the Black Ice tour with guitar just in case Malcolm couldn't play. Oh, wow. And that, yeah, I have no evidence other than what he told me. But I can see that that would be credible. Uh, apparently, the guy was struggling with trying to remember the set. Yeah. Um, and fair play to him. I mean, he's the governor and driver of the band, and he got through it. But you could be right, uh, back to your point, that maybe that's why the album is so long. They just wanted to get everything out there and go out of a bang. Or um, whether they were expecting or knew that would be the last one with Malcolm and, and this would be his last tour. I think maybe probably they did. I Possibly, suspect. right, yeah. I made a bad joke there with Rock and Roll Train, but yeah, that was the lead single. And that's a great song. That went to number one on Billboard's Hot Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. The album, number one in the US, number one in the UK and Australia. I mean, that was considered another comeback album. And then the dementia we talked about during that period develops with, with Malcolm. So how do they end up making the next album, which is Rock or Bust, which is six years later? You address this in the book. Can you talk about that? and the new member of the band with a familiar last name. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the problem that ACDC got was how to carry on without Malcolm. And then what they actually did, or the way they looked at it, was to bring in Stevie Young, who was uh, their nephew, and had actually um, stood in for Malcolm back on the uh, Blokey video tour, the American dates when Malcolm was battling, as you said earlier, with his alcoholism. And, uh, and they actually said that a lot of fans didn't know that Malcolm wasn't there because, of course, they don't introduce the band on stage or anything. So what you got was somebody looking very much like Malcolm standing in Malcolm's spot, and I think a lot of the audience wouldn't have thought any different of it. And Stevie certainly does play like Malcolm. Um, I, what surprised me, I think, was how strong an album they'd managed to come up with, really, after Malcolm had gone. I, I think Rock or Bust is was way better than I expected it was going to be. Play because ball. I, thought, is on I didn't realize. How, yeah, play ball's great. The title track, which which has a somewhat firm nod to "Back in Black" in the riff for me, is a great song. I like uh, that one very much. Um, Sweet Candy, yeah, I, I like that too. Uh, Big Jack. Oh no, I'm sorry. The Big Jack was on uh, Black Ice. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, uh, um, it's, it's a really good tribute. But notice also that the the, the publishing credits are Angus and, and Malcolm Young writing mm. everything. Um, whether Malcolm had left any lyrics behind, or whether Angus wrote all the lyrics, and all that Malcolm contributed was some riffs and bits and parts. But he still gets equal publishing by yeah. the look of it with Angus. Um, so these are clearly, all obviously, leftovers that hadn't made it onto Black Ice. But um, Angus took great pains to say that that has always been the case of ACDC. There's always been stuff they haven't used and have looked at again. Um, so for a Leftovers album is what, what you thought it was. It, it, it was. it was pretty strong. It's a pretty, pretty good album. Rock the Blues I, Away I, was another good one. Yeah, yeah. That was a single. Um, so if there was a big surprise for me, it was probably more that they decided to come back for another album after that. It's, it is amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Rocker Bus, by the way, number three, US and UK, one in Australia. But yeah, let's let's talk about that now. Their return in 2020, which was a shock, I think, to everybody. Brian Johnson had to be replaced by Axl Rose on the previous yeah. tour due to hearing issues. 
That was in 2016. Drummer Phil Rudd, he was out. He had some major legal issues stemming from oh, a criminal yeah. case. Chris Slade, who was on Razor's Edge, he comes back. Cliff Williams said he was done and retired after the tour. But the worst yeah. of all, Malcolm passed away in 2017. Yet, power up. It's, it not only happens, which is a shock that we even get this album, it's another huge success. Number one in the US, UK, and Australia. The lead single, Shot in the Dark, four more singles, Realize Demon Fire, which is Spell Through the Mists of Time. So again, I ask, how the heck do they not only end up making the album, considering everything that happened, and how do they pull off another really good album? Yeah, um, I believe that obviously these are presumed leftovers that um, it has to be said that weren't considered good enough for, for rock or bust, and that, that's where I have this confusion. I, I just assume that they use the best of what they got that Angus could find for rock or bust. So what does that make power of? Now, I wonder, does it mean that some of these tracks are actually only written by Angus? I know it says Angus Young and Malcolm Young, but you get something like Through the Mists of Time, which would appear to sort of reference um, fallen comrades such as Malcolm. So you think, has Malcolm, did he contribute anything to that? Could he have yeah. contributed anything? Does Brian contribute and just doesn't get any publishing? Some lyrics, I don't see anything that strikes me as um, being necessarily the sort of thing Brian would contribute. But I do wonder how much of these songs is the point I'm making, whether any of them are actually were brand new and not stuff that had been held back. Yeah, they, well, they list it as all tracks written by Angus Young and Malcolm Young. They do. I think Brendan mm -hmm. O'Brien, Angus, said that he was the producer and picked the, the, the songs that he liked. Uh, you know, a track I want to pick out in the album is, is, is Kick You When You're Down. Yeah, that's old school not, ACDC. Well, I hear that. And I think, I'm in the zone, man. I'm absolutely there. I mean, this is AC. They can do that all day yeah. long for me. And I am, I am in. That absolutely. came up when I was going for a ride the other day. I just popped ACDC on and just hit random on Spotify. And that was one of the ones. Yeah, it is a great song. Brendan O'Brien also produced Rocker Bust. And they're those two, right? Were those the, the only two? Or did he do the one before that as well? I believe, I think he's no. involved in Black Ice as well. Was he involved in that one as well? Yeah, Black Ice, he's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he did three. He did three, yeah. which I remember him talking about, because Brian's voice sounded really good on Black Ice, mm. and he was talking about just giving giving Brian more time in between recording so he didn't blow his, his voice out, which I think... Brian, he, um, well, I, I mean, Brian had had a point, as you well know, um, in the studio set when he sounded... Um, struggling a bit with um, the keys maybe and I think it's for me the ball break realm is when I thought that the things had come down a bit and he and stiff up a lip and I thought he sounded better than he had done in a long time and 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 actually I think he he's he's one of the he plays a terrific game on, on rock or bust and, and power up Brian he's really does lead from the front really which of course he has to because the everything would would seem to be on Angus wouldn't it I guess really it's Angus's band now clear as day it's Angus's band. Uh, when it used to be Malcolm's band, we presumably Angus more in the background a bit. Um, but but Brian has really stepped up, I think, and done real man of the match performances on these these last albums. It's hard to explain medically what happened with Brian. He talked about it, no. but it was something where he played. He had an inner ear infection or something that got worse. Mm -hmm. Played a played a show somewhere where it was super cold. Got on the got on the airplane, and it was like it crystallized inside of his ear. It's a lot of medical terminology I'm not familiar with. You could find it. It's but um, you could find it online or, or look for interviews with Brian. But anyway, long story short, is I think he had something surgically implanted right into his ear. Like he found a doctor that had a rare uh, a, a, something that was brand new piece of technology, and it's obviously worked. Yeah. And they needed to, really, because I think if ACDC were going to carry on, um, for me, with any credibility, they need Brian. Um, I mean, I'd go further and say they, they could do with Phil, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that my guess would be there's some more issues with Phil that have perhaps happened. I noticed that he's conspicuously absent on, on the website, on the on latest pictures and that kind of thing. Um so and and Cliff had obviously just come back um, for the uh, the festival they paid uh, the Power Trip Festival in October twenty three, which which was a big surprise to see them do that. 
Um, but that that looks like that's probably Cliff's um, finale with the band. Now, whether Angus brings back Cliff and Phil and records another album, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think he'll want to stop. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. What's your prediction for the future of ACDC? What would you like to see? I mean, do you want to see it end, just have them go out with that album? Maybe play a show or two here and there. I Angus like seems to... to still have it. I saw the footage of him from uh, what was the the tour, the the, the big uh, festival they played in October. The Power Trip Festival. Power Trip yeah, Festival, I watched... yeah. Um, I, I'd say I, I thought they were a bit rusty, but that, that's fair enough because they would be. They haven't played live for some time. Um, and they obviously got the new drummer in uh, as well, who's who stayed with them for live gigs, which is uh, Matt Lyag, is it? I think. And a uh, new bass player, Chris Cheney, replacing uh, Cliff Williams. And and obviously having a, a younger rhythm section is is, is going to be helpful because they'll they'll have more energy and more room to 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 do that. But um, I'd say ACDC are still credible with Angus, Brian, and Stevie. But I would just question, um, I'd question how long they can go on. They are getting older now, and Brian certainly is. Phil and Angus puts on a high-energy performance, so it will be very noticeable if all of a sudden he's just standing there not doing much. Like he said, you don't want to get out get out there on a wheelchair. <laughs> but he said, <laughs> but as long as I can feel, as long as I can feel it when I get on and I'm putting in that energy, I'll keep doing it. I think he will. Um, I mean, one of the things is, is, is um, there is scope for them, and it's, it's bound to happen, of reissuing the back catalogue with bonus tracks and live tracks, sets added. I would, I would confidently expect we will, we will get that, um, because they haven't really done it in, in the way that other bands have. I know they've just reissued the albums on vinyl for the 50th anniversary, but there's, there's no bonuses or anything on it. They could certainly, um, there must be some stuff in the archives they could look at using even if it's only live sets. So I don't think we're going to get any shortage of product coming out. They could do a new album, definitely. Um, I mean, that would probably be an easier route in some respects than to carry on touring. Um, I would have hoped that maybe ACD he might wind the touring down. I think they have a bit on this tour. Just do kind of festivals and and, and, and big events and not, not tour as much as, they, as heavily as they have. In the past, I just don't want to see them kind of become um, a caricature or um, a watered down version of what they're capable of. And as you said correctly, Angus's performances, I know people who've been to see them over the years and, and have been staggered, even up to Black Ice, who hadn't seen them before. And were just amazed at how somebody can go through a set and put that amount of effort into it as Angus does. It is extraordinary, as anyone will tell you. Yeah. I also got to say, one of the happiest places I've ever had, probably musically in my life, is being at any ACDC stadium gig. Normally, I'm not a big fan of stadium gigs. I like smaller venues and up close and personal. But you get yourself in a crowd for ACDC and Thunderstruck comes on or, um, you know, any of those big other Back tracks. and black and, yeah. Or oh, for those about to rock, I mean, it is absolutely incredible to be in a crowd um, and, and they're playing those songs. It really, really is. And they should be very, very proud of themselves for what they've done. I mean, they've, they've kind of been trendy-ish at times, I would guess. They seem to be a bit more trendy now than they ever have been. Certainly with that ubiquitous logo. I interviewed Gerard Twerter for the book, um, who did the logo, and he's amazed at how his logo is on anything and everything and everywhere what did he have to say about the creation of the logo he was very he, he'd actually done a lot of logos he'd done the blue oyster cult um live album he did the logo for that um he'd done various other bands logos as well and it, it was just a job a well-paid job he okay. showed me the original logo and he just pulled it out of a drawer next to him and this was his act this is what was sent this was the logo it's in the book yeah, very simple, and, direct, straightforward, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. The all in between. Um, and, and, and again, the point that some people have picked up on this, he was paid for doing the job to create the logo. That's how he was. Nobody said to him, oh, and by the way, in decades to come, we're going to put it on this, we're going to put it on that, it's going to be on this and that. 
And and maybe if, if that had been known at the time, you know, you might have said, well, hang on a minute, how much am I getting paid for this? But he said, you know, I got paid, I got paid well for it, I got paid right for it, they paid up. And I said, what did the band think of it? He said, I don't know. <laughs> they never said never anything. Met them. Never said, <laughs> never met them. And he said, in those days, bands like ACDC, they didn't. Um, it, it was almost a case of this is the cover. Oh, right, okay. And um, we, we we posed for the picture. We've done it. Oh, right, okay. Um, he said, he was only when you get to the levels of like, a, you know, Pink Floyd or a Led Zeppelin, they would turn up and pay the big bucks money for like hypnosis and Pacific Iron Air. And we'd be standing there and saying, um, what about this? And what about that? And we don't like this. And he's like, okay, that's the logo. Great. Yeah, I love that, you know. That's that's that sounds like ACDC. Yeah, the book is titled ACDC Every Album, Every Song. It is out March 29 in the UK. You can get it through Burning Shed, their website. I have a link to it in the show notes page. In the US, however, it's not going to be until May the 31st. But if you live in the US, you can order it through Burning Shed. Yeah. So get it. Um, so that you could do that. I'll put a link to the uh, to the Burning Shed uh, purchase if you want to get it there, but also the Amazon uh, link when it's ready to go from eight thirty one. And where can people find you, Chris? Do you have social media pages uh, and anywhere yeah. that people can reach out to you? Well, I'm on Instagram. One of my best friends on Instagram is uh, is you, so that's one way you yes. can find me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm certainly on there. Um, where else can you find me? You could find me at my day job, Smithwick Heritage Centre. We'll Big start by. Out. Okay. <laughs> Zoom that I manage in 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 just outside Birmingham, Smithwick. So people can find me there as well. Um, I'm not on Facebook really, so Instagram's the best way. I'm on there. Yeah, we should also give a quick plug to the other books that you have. Alice Cooper, you were on for that one. And what was the first time you were on for? Which one was it? I've been on three times before. I've done Alice Cooper in the 70s, Alice Cooper in the 80s, right. Black Sabbath in the 70s. And I'm currently, um, I've, I'm writing one right now. Actually, I'm writing two at this moment. Wow, okay. Oh, I'm so, this is your fourth appearance. Man, yeah. I think I got I got to check the numbers. That might be a record. I don't know. I'm four appearances. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and I, I, I tell you what, the episode that we did on the Alice Cooper book, well, and the Black Sabbath too. Now that I think of it, I mean, they they do great numbers. People um, they just they love the stories that you tell. And, I got to tell you, you know, um, I actually get emails on the back of this podcast. Hey, people that's track cool. me down and they come forward and and, and 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 that's really really great when people take the time to tell you they like something that's really good because you know it, it's such a negative critical world often right um it's great when somebody takes the time to contact you and say i, I really like this thanks for turning me on to an album i wasn't aware of or something and and, and that's a terrific feeling it really is. yeah what an incredible time we're in now where we can do this stuff with the technology and mm. And, you know, we do this, we're just you know, sitting alone in a room doing this, so you don't know who's going to listen to it. But then it goes out there on the Internet, and you just say, hey, you just put it out there and you see what happens. But, yeah, I still get a lot of great comments as well. So uh, yeah. did you want to tell us what you're working on, or is it a secret, the two yeah, books? Yeah, no, I can do. Um, there's one which will be has been delayed, which was a, um, a book on Sparks in the 70s, the, the Mayo Brothers. And um, we're, we're, we're ironing out, a, 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 shall we say, a couple of queries on that book. Okay. That we'd had in. But that's getting sorted. Um, the big one, um, the ridiculous one, is the Sheik organisation, which I'm writing at the moment, which is Nile Rogers, Bernard Edwards, and their work with Sheik, Sister Sledge, David Bowie, Madonna, Diana Ross, Johnny Mathis, um, you know, Sheila Big Devotion. There's a lot of albums they've worked on. That, that, that That's ambitious and then the one that's chopped and changed a bit and kind of the dust has settled um originally i was going to do black sabbath in the 80s and then that just looked like being almost too difficult for the word count you have to do for these books to be frank because um there's so many singers let alone everyone else in sabbath in the 80s and it, it kind of um I had a chat with the publishers sonic bond publishing and it's become black sabbath the do years Okay, specifically the Dio years. And well, that's going to do well. Okay. Um, and yeah, because they call the band Heaven and Hell. 
right? That was, yeah. wasn't that in the 2000s that they had to do that? There was a legal reason? Yeah, I, I think, and also partly I think it made more sense to call the band um, Heaven and Hell because it, it differentiated it to, to the output that yeah. they'd done with, with Dio. I've done one interview already for that book and I've got two in the next couple of days. Um, the interview we, I did with Greg Hildebrandt, who did the cover of Mob Rules, was really fascinating. I was so lucky to get this guy to talk to me. He doesn't normally talk to people, apparently. Cool. Um, for, but he did because of one of the questions that I'd asked in the email. Um, when will that come out, do you think, that, that Dio era? Uh, I would probably guess early next year. It might be quicker okay. than that, potentially. Um, it, it's lining up the interviews. I've got two lined up. I've got Mike Exeter, who uh, engineered and played on the um, Best of the Devil You Know album, Heaven and Hell. He's been working with Tony Iommi for some years. And the one I'm really looking forward to is on Monday, I've got Wynn Davis. And his remix um, of Live Evil um, is, is astonishing. I don't know if you've got that Live Evil. No. Set at all. Oh, I you don't. must. Yeah. Oh, you've got um, the, the original. If you listen to the album and then you put his remix on, oh, it's night and day. Yeah, well, I need you to invest more time into the Dio years because I'm a, I'm a Sabbath, Ozzy era Die hard, but I, I know of of a lot of the Dio songs, the Dio era Black Sabbath songs, but I really don't I can't say I'm I'm an expert on the Dio era Black Sabbath, which is why I look forward to reading a book like that. I want to learn more. I want to know more. I, I think you're right. I think where the Dio era um I suppose you might have a problem with it is is Ronnie Dio singing um songs that Ozzy sang. Um, and and that, that certainly is probably an area that you might find a little difficult potentially to get into, I would say. Um, Ronnie James Dale tends to kind of stage almost perform the songs in a way. And, and those songs are quite tricky to do. Extremely really different really styles vocally. Yeah, absolutely different styles. Yeah. So well, it's, it's all good fun. Looking forward to having you back on for any or all of those books. So Chris Sutton, thanks so much. As, as always, it's always great having you here and look forward to, to having you back on. Oh, it's always a pleasure. It really is. I, as I say, I always finish one of these books and I think now I can get hold of Eric and go and have a chat. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great to hear. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Eric. Take care, man. That's it. It's in the books.